Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for coming out for the last uh, presidential plenary session of this year's American Academy of Religion. This session is called The Public Religion Scholar in a Social Media Age, Risks, Rewards, and Reverberations. And the description is in your program book. What the purpose of this session really is to talk about what it's like to find oneself becoming a public figure, whether one intends to or not, as a scholar of religion. I had fun um, thinking through our membership and knowing that there are dozens of really very well-known, very visible public intellectuals in the American Academy of Religion to try to put together a panel that would represent a, a, a lot of different kinds of experiences and perspectives and backgrounds and so on. And what I envision is just a very honest conversation with our panelists about, about how, whether, how one becomes a public figure as a scholar of religion, whether that's a goal, whether it's an accident, what it's like when it happens, what the upside is, what the downside is, and, and whether it's something that people should be striving for or running as far and as fast away from as possible. Our panelists are Professor Eddie Glaude of Princeton University, Professor Larisha Hawkins of the University of Virginia, Professor Candida Moss of the University of Birmingham, Professor Simran Jeet Singh of New York University, and Professor Najiba Saeed Miller of the Claremont School of Theology. Instead of me telling you why I think their stories are interesting, I will let you tell them, tell their stories themselves. So let us begin. Okay, so here is my first question for each of our panel, and uh, these are not surprise questions, so they've had a chance to think about it a little bit. So here's the first question, or group of questions. When you began your career, what was your vision of what you would do? Did you imagine the public role and controversy that your work would eventually develop? Was being a public figure an original goal? And anybody can jump in first, and let's just hear from all of you. I'll start. Um, I did prepare answers to the questions, so I might actually read them kind of spontaneously, but um, I can recall applying for academic positions, um, all the personal statements. I've seen people like sitting in hallways and I'm like, that's an interview, they're interviewing. He looks so nervous, she looks so nervous. Um, my personal statements, the ones expressing my pedagogical and professional commitments. Um, and the theme that reverberated for me was one of relevance. And um, what does my discipline, political science, and my scholarly questions, ones that revolve around the intersection of race, ethnicity, religion, and politics, and those of you who study race know the more you do race, you do gender, you do sexuality, or vice versa, the more you do gender, you do race and sexuality, and class, of course. Um, what do these mean um, if it remains fodder only for the closed scientific community? For journals, so my credo, was relevance. Um, and part of this was based on reading um, the past um, actual presidential addresses of um, the presidents of the American Political Science Association. So my PhD is in political science. And a credo or a theme that I saw every 10 years or so was this questioning of, is our discipline actually relevant to what's happening in the, in the real world, if you will? And so um, that was the question, um, was, and, and the goal was for um, political science generally and my work specifically um, to be relevant to the world beyond the barren Anthropocene that is academe. Um, so beyond questions of academic freedom and speech and relevance and influence, I think the question of public religion scholarship is one also about how our bodies do work for us in the academy. Um, and so. Those are some of the questions that, the ways that I was thinking about your first question, David. Thank you. So I, 
I am what I call an embodied interruption, whether I choose to be or not. When I walk into a space attached to my body are biases that may or may not be related to my actual existence. So whether I make the choice to be public or not, when I walk into a room at the AAR, I am in many ways um, already, already uh, an interruption for whatever is happening around me. So I would say I never set out to be a public figure, but it became inevitable because of how and who I am. And there's other reasons that I'm a public figure. When one participates in a community, for instance, two years ago, right before the elections, my mosque was threatened by an individual. We received death threats. So whether or not I want to be public, not only in my scholarly space, but in my community space, when it is under attack, I therefore am a public figure if I'm participating in that community. So everywhere I go, there's some level of bodily surveillance. And both at this time when Islam is uh, really a factor in, in what some scholars are talking about as Muslim cool, there is an interest in our bodies, but not an interest in our real thoughts. There's a public disciplining for scholars who engage in critical thinking of the tradition, and yet at the same time, if, go, if they go too far in their critical perspectives on issues such as state violence, then they may be disciplined in their job, they may be disciplined in other ways. So uh, it's an interesting place to be, and Fatima Keshavaz talks about that the market needs native Islamophobic informants. It used to be that the name of someone who didn't sound Muslim, didn't look Muslim, but the market needs brown faces at this time, and that those names sound Muslim, and the agenda, in fact, is very deeply Islamophobic. So we live in a time of tension, and we live in a time where the choice to be public or not is not one that I'm given. It's one that's thrust upon me. I've always thought of myself as aspiring to be, in some significant way, a political figure or a public figure. And it has something to do with the intersection of, hold on, I'm my mama's child. Thank you, David, for, I just, my mom just popped in my head. Thank you for, for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, it has something to do with my commitment to philosophical pragmatism and my positioning within the black intellectual tradition. The latter is most often public facing, right? Where we engage in a kind of criticism where we're involved in interpreting America to itself as we are now in light of what we can be. So there's a kind of public facing that's uh, a part of what it means to stand in this tradition. And then as a philosophical pragmatist, particularly coming out of the work of John Dewey, I was particularly impressed by a passage from the influence of Darwin on philosophy in 1910 where he says, um, philosophy must in time become a method of locating and interpreting the more serious of the conflicts that occur in life, and a method of projecting ways for dealing with them, a method of moral and political diagnosis and prognosis. So philosophy in, in Dewey's hands and in my hands, coming through Cornell West, of course, is a form of social criticism. So how do I bring my skill set to bear on the problems facing the people I care most about, and how do I bring my skill set to bear uh, on, on my commitments, right, in pursuit of the good. Um, and so it's in light of that pursuit from my, that, that is evidence in my scholarly work and in my political life uh, that it all converged and then all of this stuff happened. Um, I think I might be the odd one out here in the sense that I accidentally became a public scholar. When I started out, um, the okay, so you think I would know this. Um, when I began my career, I envisioned myself engaging in the critically important task of dating early Christian martyrdom accounts composed between the first and mid second century. And um, I acknowledge the privilege in being able to take that kind of intellectual position. And then, having written two books on martyrdom, I wrote a trade book on persecution and the use of the history of persecution in modern political discourse that everybody hated. 
And because of that, I ended up on O'Reilly and writing a column and being a CBS Papal News contributor. But for me, it was accidental. And I certainly have had to think about what it means to be a public intellectual, how to use this platform that I have, and what, what the boundaries are of this kind of work. What can be done, what can't be done, and in what venues it can be done. I'm, I'm the junior scholar here, so I, I'll keep it shorter. It's, it's a, an honor to be on the panel with folks I've admired for a while, and actually uh, much of my public work I've modeled after what I've seen from them in terms of what's effective and what's ethical. Um, for me, I'm actually really interested in what you said and pointed out that um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot, and I've heard a lot of conversations here this weekend about this, that for people of color in particular, um, it's not really an option whether you're a public scholar or not because we live in such a way that our bodies are on the line every day and our families' bodies are on the line. And so I was just interested, Candida, that you pointed that out, that I think the question of whether we ought to be a public scholar or not is a question about privilege, mm. right? Who gets to not be a public scholar? Yep. And so for me, my own story comes from, you know, I was in high school, I was a senior in high school when the 9-11 attacks happened and the violent backlash that occurred against people who looked like me, um, it, it, it formed my identity in a way that I only am starting to understand now. Uh, the people who I had always understood as my people, I grew up in Texas, right? No South Asians, no Muslims, I didn't have any of those friends, and all of a sudden, I was Muslim, and I was Arab, right? And, and so, for me, what I saw in that context was a vacuum of power for these marginalized communities, and I wanted to help. So my scholarship has always been informed by politics, and that has been part of my, my ethic. The other thing I'll, I'll sort of say around that is the ways in which this has come about has been very different than how I would have ever expected. I was terrified of public speaking my whole life. Through graduate school, I would never talk in class because I was so worried about what people would think. Um, and so for me, I thought of my work as education, as public education, uh, but I never thought about it as public facing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do the work, but sort of stay behind the books. Um, and so this has sort of come out in a, in a very different way for me than I would have ever expected. David, can I add something as a learning, like as a pedagogical moment that one of the things of being a public um, religion scholar is always questioning um, whether to say what you actually decided to say. Um, and the first thing I wanted to say is a discussion of what it means to be a public scholar in a social media age is a discussion about bodies and space and time, hijab, black, turban, brown, female, queer, single, non-male, beyond binaries. The nature of academe, which I prefer to call the academic enterprise, inclusive of incentives, a discussion of purpose, of profession, of pedagogy, of performativity, and of various publics. And what I didn't say is that my body is suspect to students, to parents, to colleagues, to administrations, and to a public who, when offended by my raced and gendered and sexed body performing its profession in hijab, attempts to shame and silence me. The administration takes the low road, the road of silencing my body rather than standing with and for it. So this has to be a conversation about the political economy of the academy and about what it means to be um, scholars of color. Kudos to David for choosing women and scholars of color to be on this panel with him. I was on an airplane when he gave his public address, but he's living what he said and there's a documentary um, about me, which is kind of shameless to mention, but he's in it as a scholar who is living what he speaks and preaches and challenging the contours and the borders of evangelicalism, even as he stands as a body who is contested within that tradition and over now and against that tradition, who you all um, see as the liberal, progressive, advancing, but what you should know is what he does comes at a price. And so I also want to serve as a corrective to myself, who silenced myself as a public scholar in this age, because like Najiba said very bravely, I didn't have a choice. But it was always a goal. 
to be someone whose work was relevant to where my people live, where marginalized people live, and how we act and are in the world. And yes, to inform people in my profession, but more than that, if I never gain recognition in my profession, to be someone who speaks to the most vulnerable and the most oppressed and the most marginalized. Thank you. Thank you, Larisha. Um, thank you very much. A, a few of you have already begun to answer this question, but I'm asking for some storytelling, some more storytelling, if you're willing to offer it, related to pivotal moments in which your visibility kind of leaped forward. Um, and uh, maybe what was that and what was that like? What were the implications positively or negatively? So maybe particular incidents or moments or stories that you might be willing to share. You know, I think uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to speak at a uh, college, and the topic that I was addressing was Islam and peacemaking. And I received a targeted death threat and by an identifiable individual. And uh, the threat was deemed high. So for the first time in my life, I did not take the stage. I was silenced as a scholar because if I spoke, the university made the determination that my lev the level of harm that was going to be done to me was, was one that was very high and they could not, um, they could not, they, they felt that the individual, as they evaluated the individual who made the threats, they felt they could not keep me safe. So they said, it's your choice to speak or not. I'm the mother of two young children, and I hate public disclosures about my private life. That's not what I wanted to be known for. So as a scholar of color, that's the part that I don't like to have to talk about. My scholarship is what should stand for itself. But for the first time, about three years ago, I always faced death threats, but this was a targeted, pointed individual, and I didn't speak and I didn't take the stage. And I have taken the stage in many, many situations. I'm a mediator of violent conflicts around the world. I do gang intervention work in Los Angeles. I live at the spaces where violence occurs, but I was silenced. So for me, it wasn't, and at that point, I got off of social media, I shut down my social media, I pulled out of a lot of public life. This was close to the time, a couple of months later, where I was working with the Oprah team on a series, invited to her house, but it was, it was incredible that the very thing that I was trying to promote, which was interreligious understanding, was weaponized against me because an individual saw a picture of a woman in hijab coming to speak at their campus. So that targeted, and my children were supposed to be with me that day, and that's what really struck me. So it's about the times that we are able to, um, so I wasn't even the topic that I was addressing, was, didn't have anything to do with, um, with being critical. It was actually a, a topic that I often teach about. So I wanted to share that with you because not only is it not my choice to be public, but the capacity in which the threats are real and how they silence me as a scholar. Everywhere I speak, I now know there are students in the audience, sometimes from that school, working for websites around the country, writing down what I say. So I am constantly surveilled, not just by law enforcement, but I'm also surveilled academically in my freedom, and it shuts down my capacity to write sometimes. So these are real questions of academic freedom. And we have a Muslim ban that's keeping those that are from countries who are critical of the United States, the very voices we need to hear, cannot travel to bring that critical voice to the table. To me, it's no longer a question of affect and whether you like me or not. It's a question of are we building an intellectual tradition that is contested, that is um, inclusive in its capacity to be able to have the embodied knowledge of scholars who don't just live a particular life, but they do a particular scholarship. For those of us that are pre-tenure, we are afraid to put Palestine posters in our offices. That is a joke among Arab and Muslim scholars. Wait till you get tenure. You better not put up or talk about Palestine publicly. Let me, um, 
Najib, I'm moved by your story, and I know when that happened. I mean, I was following that story about the death threat, and um, I'll, I'll share something that I have not shared before um, based on legal counsel, um, but I, you know, I, I, I feel like I should because I worry that I might regret not sharing this, and, and folks who need to hear this should hear this. Can you get a little closer to the microphone? Sure. Um, Similar type of story. Um, I, I was teaching Islamic studies in Texas, uh, tenure track, pre-tenure. Um, a few conservative students um, got me on the radar of, of campus reform uh, because of a few tweets that I put out post-election, post-Trump's election, um, not of myself. Actually, specifically the tweet that came into question uh, was a tweet of a photo of my brother uh, standing in front of Trump Tower in New York with his middle finger up. And that tweet, it had been six, eight months afterwards. Students had saved that tweet. And when I was giving a lecture on uh, navigating hate in modern America, um, that, that tweet came back out. Um, and I was sort of, articles started coming out on you know Breitbart and campus reform. Uh, asking the question of how could a scholar who took a photo in front of Trump Tower with his middle finger up talk about anti-hate and anti-racism. Um, and so it was, it was a funny thing, right, because it wasn't me, and they had assumed it was me, and I took it as an opportunity, and my brother doesn't look like me, and I took it as an opportunity to point out the, the exact sort of issue I was trying to describe around racism, right, and like we don't all look the same, and you think we do, and there's, there's more to this than that. Um, and, and it was complicated. Looked into filing a defamation suit. Uh, university administrative office got involved. Uh, death threats, um, public accountability, uh, ended up on the professor watch list. And all of this is to say these are, these are stories that we all experience in different ways. Uh, this is not the first time for me. Najiba's had more that she could tell you, right? These are, these are stories that many people in this room have. And I think what's interesting to me about this is particularly the point of who are the people in positions of precarity that don't have the protections and what would it look like in our community to support people in these positions. The reason that the lawyer told me not to go public is because he said if you want tenure, if you want to go back on the market, which I'm back on the market now, all this stuff is out there about me and universities are scared because we don't have structures of support. Right? We don't actually know how we want to deal with public scholarship. And so the question for me that I want to turn to you is, what would that look like for us to sort of come together and support one another, right? Those of us who have these experiences, and it really affects our careers and our family lives and our families. So that's, that's where I want this conversation to go. Um, let me just go ahead and answer the question in this way. Um, Look, I mean, stuff around death threats is, you know, you just got to do the work. Period. You just got to do the work, because if, if you worry about it, if you concern yourself about it, uh, then, then you can't do the work. And so, um, I don't want to get into the particulars, you know. Um, the, um, the moment, it was the State of the Black Union with Tavis Smiley. I got invited. Uh, to be on with Tavis, and everything changed. Uh, we were traveling around the country with the State of the Black Union as a book. Uh, we were holding town hall meetings, and I started using those town hall meetings as sites to think about my understanding of democracy. And it was in that context that I wrote In a Shade of Blue, uh, Pragmatism and the Politics of Black America. So we were traveling around the country together and as we were moving in between cities, I was going back to the hotel at night, writing chapters, trying to process what I was experiencing every night um, in terms of my intellectual commitments. So why well, bring that up? Because being a public intellectual isn't just simply about being in public. It's about thinking seriously with others in public. And so I'm always trying to figure out how to bring uh, what I read, how I'm thinking, uh, 
the way I'm imagining democracy, how am I thinking about community, how am I thinking about grassroots organizing at a certain level of abstraction, how do I bring it uh, to bear in these environments where I'm learning and interacting with everyday folk? So we were having these town hall meetings across the country, uh, and I remember following Cornell West and Tavis Smiley. They would get up and speak, and everybody would just go crazy, right? I mean, you know, you follow Cornell West, right? And I'm a student of Cornell's, but you know, you follow Cornell, Cornell get up and start talking his thing, and everybody would go crazy. And when I talked, folks would be silent. <laughs> and I didn't know what the hell was going on, you know? And then when I finished talking, I would get a standing ovation, and then I would go away. And I said, and I, but every time we would stop, folks would just go crazy while they were t in the middle of their talking. Yes, go ahead, brother. Da, da. But when I was talking, they were just sitting there. And so I turned to a friend of mine, and he said, that's because they're listening to you, brother. That's because they're trying to process what you're saying. And it was, it was not so much a critique of Cornell, but it was an ins insistence that I stay in my lane that I understand, ex that I have to understand exactly what my charge is. Uh, Jim Wallace said something to me uh, today at breakfast. He said, we don't go right or left, we go deeper. Mm. So in these moments, uh, when I have this platform, and this happened, how do I create the conditions for people to think about the subject at hand in a much more complex and nuanced way? And how do I learn how to do that in sound, sound bites, how do I learn how to do that in quick moments uh, to just spark and prick right, someone? And it happened during the Tavis Smiley thing. And then when I started peeping what was going on, I said, oh, this is not quite consistent with my ethic. Mm -hmm. So I pulled away. And it was in the midst of that. I had a radio show, a regular commentary, da 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 da. But then, you know, there's always these three things that I keep in mind. Speak truth to power, speak truth to power with integrity, right? And, and, and in so many, in, in significant way, right? Just never lose sight of what you're here to do, right? Be true to your vocation, you know what I mean? Um, so that was the moment. Uh, and then I lost it. And then it came back. And we could talk about how it came back. I lost it because I chose to lose it, by the way. Yes. Have to, you have to follow up, have to follow that up. With wood. No, I mean the thing is, is that you know people think that you know we don't. I don't. I don't aspire to be a public intellectual to get paid. Right? You don't. I don't aspire to be a public intellectual to to wear Hickey Freeman suits and 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 be on television. Right? I just happened to write a book. That Crown put me on television with Joe Scarborough. They liked what I said, and then boom, it just took off. Because before then, I was persona non grata, because I was a critic of, of Obama, right? So I lost, I mean, I, I was blackballed during the B Obama years, for eight years. And I was saying the same thing then that I'm saying now. Um, and I made a decision, because I'm my mama's child, I'm Juanita's child, that whenever you lose your way, you have a way of recentering. So the, the objective, the motivation for doing this work isn't about you, it's about, it's about that vocation around speaking for the least of these. Mm. And so I saw some things that I didn't like and I just pulled away. And I would say one of the reasons that I do this work is because I'm a radical believer in hope. Mm. So when I was first hired as a professor at Claremont, it was the last election cycle in which the mosque at the 9-11 site was the big issue. I made a commitment for two years to take speaking engagements in the heartland and the south of the United States. And only and often in small colleges, in rural areas, because I felt that there was the capacity with everything that was going on, I have an indelible and irrational belief that there is engagement that will actually transform lives. So for two years, and I tried to reach, my goal was to reach about 100,000 people in different ways. So I took these speaking engagements and people say, why are you in Iowa when Islamophobia has just done an uptick? Why are you down in this small college in North Carolina? Because my belief was that it wasn't just the public scholarship that's glamorous. It's the kind that I used to do when I went to college in North Carolina. I was reminded I went to a Quaker college. I went to rural North Carolina in the 90s when people didn't even know what Islam was and talked about my tradition because 
what I believe in is that there is an ethical obligation to use the language of Newton's representational ethics to represent the voices of the communities who name me to use the language of Tony Cade Vambera. So those communities that name me, this platform is not me. It's about speaking not for communities that are powerless, but for communities that are incredible. And everywhere I would go when people would ask me, well, why do you want to take over the country? And I would give a very intellectual conversation, but every time I speak, those are the questions I get, and questions about Sharia. And what surprised me was that, was that it wasn't really bravery for me to show up only. It was for those people that came to the room and asked me those questions. So I just wanted to share that with you. Public scholarship is not always glamorous. It's not always on TV. Any and all of you can do it in public schools. So I just wanted to encourage us to think about transformation through education, through public education, that doesn't just speak to the heart, but it brings the mind into a rational conversation when irrational forces have chosen to portray all of us as demons in one another's eyes. I wanted to uh, ask uh, Candida to tell us a little bit more about your story because it, I think it's so striking that um, the poisonous nature of, of the environment that we live in is such that uh, a New Testament scholar doing research on early Christian martyrdom would also end up um, uh, targeted in some of the most uh, noxious ways. It, it, um, can you tell us just a little bit more about that experience? Uh, sure. Um, when I was on Bell O'Reilly, having written this book, Myth of Persecution, I remember getting off the plane, having, I got straight on a plane afterwards, I get off the plane in O'Hare, I see myself on the screens across O'Hare Airport, I turn on my phone and I start to see the thousands of emails in my inbox and the Twitter feed. And I, the death threats, I think we have all gotten death threats. I want to say for women, the rape threats yes, mm -hmm. um, are pretty extreme too. I think this will come up later in the discussion. Think very carefully about whether or not you truly have institutional support mm -hmm. when something like this happens, because your colleagues will get these emails too. Oh. Um, the, the, what I experienced, yeah, the president too. Mm. And they're not always thrilled. Even if you say something that they like, like on O'Reilly, I was like, we should help the poor. I thought that was a banal statement. It was not. I thought a Catholic institution would, would be unambiguously behind me. They were not. <laughs> and um, I guess what I would say about that is there's a real trickle down. The public hatred is horrifying. People calling you a whore is horrifying. What I experience, I only occasionally have experienced being called a race traitor, which I consider to be a huge compliment. Mm -hmm. And, um, but <laughs> the an anti-Semitism, sometimes that gets directed my way. And when that happens, I'm aware that as horrifying as it is for me, as a white female blonde Catholic at Notre Dame, who was a full professor, I cannot imagine what it would be like to be a junior scholar of color in experiencing that. Um, and I, and just the fraction of what I've experienced, I, I cannot convey to you my admiration enough. Um, I think what I didn't anticipate, the poison I didn't anticipate was the way it would trickle into my institution, into my classrooms, into my field from colleagues, from former grad students. To give just one example, I was chairing, Wendy Davis came to Notre Dame, it was obviously very controversial, and I was there just to ask questions that were put to her by students. And while this was happening, a chat group run by Notre Dame Republican students were discussing raping me. One of those students was in my class. So it is, I, I wish I could say that it's just these anonymous people and that's horrifying, like getting rape threats is terrifying. Um, getting death threats is terrifying when they call you, you don't know how serious it is. But it is heartbreaking when it is your own students and your colleagues. 
Larisha Hawkins, um, it may be that some of our audience doesn't know much about your experience at Wheaton. Would you like to say just a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I'll just read what I prepared so as not to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> but, but it's also, I want to say, um, for those of you out there, um, I hope you comprehend um, the amount of, of fear and trembling um, that is on this stage. Um, that as we speak, we're reliving and being re-traumatized and people sharing things that they've been advised not to share. Out of a, out of a commitment to our discipline, out of a commitment to public scholarship, and out of a commitment um, to being real in the midst of those things. Um, and so I want to say to my colleagues up here, thank you. Um, but also so that you recognize that we're interacting with you and I hope you know that your body posture right now matters, we see it. Um, and just as a reminder, so I'm reading this because it's important for me to not say shit I'm not supposed to say. Um, so the political economy of the academy, um, which I referenced, this conversation has to be part of. Um, the neoliberal nature of the academy in which ostensibly we, you, I instantiate liberal values in an academy which feigns commitment to fostering, creating, and supporting a zone of freedom, a wide open space where di dangerous ideas are free to roam, where students are free to gaze on them, gestate them, and spit them out like cud, but where in fact the prime directive is to festoon profs like good slaves on the plantation, the ones who do their duty by getting the same old grants and stoking the right, stroking the right powers in the right G-spots, and in doing so, padding their pockets and the university's endowment. This conversation has to be one of confessions about presumed academic freedom, and this is my story, um, in the iron cage of the ivory tower, which my colleague, Ebony um, yesterday referred to as um, the Ebony Tower, but I come to you as both a captor of my home colony and one complicit in others' captivity. I come to you as a woman raised in a black Christian church that has for too long denied the equality of women's bodies in the pulpit, not to mention which has marginalized LGBTQ bodies with its own form of don't ask, don't tell. I come to you as one who wears the mantle of black womanist, but dons it ironically, knowing that the term means nothing to nobody but people like me. I come to you from what academia frames as outside the bounds of rational discourse, the repugnant Christian other, even in, Jude in Judeo-Christian Europe, or especially repugnant here, where true, the true enlightenment began as it goes, enlightenment that, that denudes Muslim women from their hijabs and niqabs and burqas and burkinis in favor of a gospel of the secular. I come to you as one with a precarious positionality in the iron cage of the ivory tower, which will be exemplified by the things that I have experienced, dare I say, suffered. The revolution that I hope we're on the front lines of will not be peer reviewed, friends. But here we are in the iron cage of the ivory tower seeking legitimization as new PhDs or as professors or publishers or contingent faculty while ostensibly resisting co-optation and colonization of our bodies to the man. Yet here we are eschewing assimilation and accommodation of other bodies to the neoliberal hegemony that wages violence with intransigent impunity. But that neoliberal hegemony is not only replicated in the academy, the academy actually created the man. The academic enterprise by its very nature breeds conformity of our creeds and our credulities and our convictions to the methods and dictates and diatribes, the same old tired ones of the panopticon that is the academy. PhD students learn early to adjust your agendas and expectations. Your fire for evolution is snuffed out in the first sociological theory seminar freshman year of undergrad because clearly PhD students did their homework back then too. It was long ago that you capitulated, friends, by disciplining, disciplining and punishing yourself in Foucauldian fashion. How do I know? Because I'm the academic trying to claim my own capitulations, a professor who teaches theory to the hilt but insists on its relevance to the real world where bodies are decimated by our unwillingness to see beyond the veneers of Venn diagrams and volume sets on the idea of revolution divested from the realities of the oppressed in our midst. So I'm an academic qua activist, but I am here to tell you that there is a price tag for academic freedom and there is a price to be paid for activism, whether in the academy or outside of it. 
Academic freedom is not free. It may cost you your very livelihood in the very sovereign space of exception that we call the academy. The rules can change such that you are cast out of the evolved garden of academic Eden and submitted to the bare life. Abandoned by the institution academe that once took you under its wing, spit out like Jonah from the belly of the whale and set under a tree of little shade to wither and die. That is the fate for the voices of the prophets in the academic wilderness. But there is hope. And I'm here to remind you that the revolution will not, in fact, be peer reviewed. Because as Theta Scotch Poll reminds us, revolutions are involuntary. So I posted a statement on Facebook once in December 2015 that perhaps was my shocking entree into the broader public, although I had done writing of editorials and service on panels and public scholarship ad nauseum before. The statement went like this. I don't love my Muslim neighbor because she or he is American. I love my Muslim neighbor because she or he deserves love by virtue of his or her human dignity. I stand in human solidarity with Muslim neighbor because we are formed of the same primordial clay, descendants of the same cradle of humankind, a cave in Sturkfontein, South Africa, that I had the privilege to descend into to plumb the depths of our common humanity in 2014. I stand in religious solidarity with Muslims because they, like me, a Christian, are people of the book. And as Pope Francis stated last week, we worship the same God. But as I tell my students, this is the pedagogy part, friends, theoretical solidarity is not solidarity at all. Thus, Beginning tonight, my solidarity has become embodied solidarity. Again, this was December 2015, the same week as the San Bernardino shootings, the same week that Jerry Falwell Jr. said, let's end those Muslims before they end up, as we all had gun permits, and he says this in chapel, we could end those Muslims before they end us. That's context, that's background. As part of my Advent worship, I will wear the hijab to work at Wheaton College to play in Chi-Town, to the airport, on the airplane home to my home in Oklahoma, the state that initiated one of the first anti-Sharia laws read unconstitutional and Islamophobic and also at church. I invite all women into the narrative that is embodied hijab wearing solidarity with our Muslim sisters for whatever reason. A large scale movement of women in solidarity with hijabs is my Christmas wish this year. And that was it. The Facebook post that went round the world and resulted in my separation from tenure as the first black woman tenured at an institution formed as um, a stop on the Underground Railroad, an abolitionist institution, Wheaton College in Chicago, Illinois. That's how I burst onto the public scholar stage. You know, um, when you organize a panel you know what you want to talk about, but you don't know what it's going to feel like until you're in it. Um, I thank you uh, for your um, transparency and honesty and the cost. I mean, if I were on the panel, I would tell you about my death threats. I asked for security at the 2015 AAR because of the death threats that I had gotten. I guess what I would ask you next is, and some of you have already begun to answer it, um, once this becomes your reality, the reality, the context in which you do your work, that it'll never not be your reality. Um, how do you find peace and continue to move forward? I, I think for me it's, it's actually easy uh, to find peace and move forward because I, I, I do this work out of conviction. Uh, it aligns my values with my actions. Uh, that gives me immense satisfaction. And so despite the risks and the vulnerabilities that come with it, it makes me happy. I feel like I'm giving to the world, I'm serving, and th these are my values. And so for me and my family, the questions we've been asking about safety and security have changed over time as things have matured and evolved. 
but the, but the feeling, the reward that comes with knowing you're making an impact in the world, that hasn't changed, right? From the classroom when I was teaching to going out and doing public lectures or being on Twitter and having people respond or being on TV and having people respond. Again, it's not about the personal cult. Right? It's, if, you're not, if you're in it for that, then you won't ever find satisfaction because there's always more to go grow. But if you're in it for the service and if you're in it for the process, if you actually really care about the people that you're serving, then that constant satisfaction will always be there, right? And it's not about the outcomes. It's not about the risks. It's not about what happens to you. It, what, it's about what happens to the people you're serving. And so for me, it's always there. And so it's, it's, it's very simple in that sense. So I do this work not to teach but to learn. So one of the reasons, and for anyone thinking about public scholarship, whether or however you orient yourself theologically, spiritually, ethically, humility is the key for me to be sustained in this work. Because if the work is driven by ego, or the work is driven because I'm a brand that has something to promote, to me, that's an empty form of scholarly existence. And frankly, it's really boring. So I do this work to learn because the ideas that I engage are transformational for my students at the graduate level, transformational for my doctoral students. But to me, when I'm sitting at a table after being invited to speak at the University of uh, Nebraska at Omaha, and three or 400 people, Christian Peterson invited me, and I sit and speak with three or 400 people about women and peacemaking and religion and Islamophobia, the transformation is two ways. If I am close to the capacity to be transformed the, by the people who I'm engaging with, and I've reached such a state of ego and comfortability with my intellectual acumen, I'm a lost cause. So if any of you are coming to this work thinking you are just a teacher and you're not a learner, and it won't change you somehow, and I will do this work until someone shackles me down mm. because it's not about just promoting my community or my viewpoints. It's about the relationships that I make with scholars, with rabbis who have been the ones that have shown up with me when I need them for safety. It's about the capacity to believe that human existence transcends the current, narrow, limited, unprophetic, puerile, and incredibly unintelligent existence that's promoted as a perpetual state of human beings in conflict. I believe in a different future, and if I don't stand at the place where I'm going to change it, it will never change. You know, I, I, um, I don't separate my public work from my intellectual work, and I think this is really important. Uh, of course, we're all citizens. You could be working on, uh, you know, ancient uh, 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 Greek papyri. <laughs> You're still a citizen. You still live in the world, right? Uh, so there's no necessary relationship between the nature of the work that I do and speaking to the problems that we face. But there is, in my self-understanding, an intimate, organic relationship between my scholarship and my public work. And I'm constantly trying to figure out how to bring my, those ideas to bear on the problems we face in the world to broader publics and learning in the process. Um, so I see myself as a social critic, philosophy as social criticism, offering again an interpretation of America to itself as we are now in the hopes of, of, of providing, opening up space for imagining a different way of being, a different set of arrangements. And I do so with the understanding that I come, come out of a tradition where folks have been shot down, you know? Um, when the pipe bombs came, since we were all sharing, I had to call my wife, because there was a long list. And we found out Van Jones was on the list. I get calls every day, every time I'm on television, because I'm usually on conservative shows. So you can imagine me on Morning Joe and what I get after I'm on Morning Joe. I'm gonna be on Morning Joe tomorrow, right? And every time I'm on Morning Joe, some conservative calls and I get the N-word and da-da-da-da. You can't come into our buildings. All the offices are locked. 
because from the bottom floor to the top floor, everybody has been under death threat from Kianga Yamada Taylor to Imani Perry to myself. So African American studies in, at Princeton is on lockdown co constantly. Uh, I got to keep my head on a swivel. For those of you who don't know what that means, you know, I'm constantly looking. My wife is a wreck because she thinks something's going to happen. We had to change the phone number over and over again. There was one period where, you know, I had this kind of romantic moment, this nostalgic moment. They kept calling every two hours. The phone would ring, I would answer the phone, and then they would hang, they would just sit there. We would hang up, the phone would ring. Then I said, yo, this ain't, this ain't goddamn 1955. Fuck you, boom. And I, and I hung up the phone. Excuse me, AAR members. Um, <laughs> and then they just called again, right? And so she's part of this work. I have a certain understanding of how I've committed myself to this work, right? You just do it, right? It's part of my intellectual vocation. But there are people around me that I love who haven't made that choice, right? They haven't made that choice. She just fell in love with me. I don't know why she still loves me but by the grace, right? So it's in those moments, right? I could pull up my phone right now. I got cameras all over the house. Right? I went to go get my friend. My best friend is like, yo, he's my golf partner. I need to take you to go get this gun. So I'm going to, because you know, we're getting that kind of threat. They found my son at his workplace. Can you imagine? I only have one child. He's grown, but they found him in New York. And when I got the hate mail, they CC'd him over and over and over again, FBI investigating, right? So you go get to pick up the gun, and you say, this is just meant to kill somebody. Can't do this, right? You make these choices, but there are people around you who love you, and they, and they, have, to, they have to endure it with you. But the reason I do it is because I've been called to do it, and I don't do it because I want to be on television. That might end tomorrow, and I'm good with it, because I got tenure. Y'all going to get it too, <laughs> right? Because that's, that's not what's motivating me to do this work, right? I am an intellectual who takes himself to be engaged in the task of thinking seriously in public with others. If you can do that, then you're good. And then you just try, try to think about how to do that across various platforms. And then maybe we could build a better future together. And risk comes with that, trust. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anybody else? So morbid. Yeah. Um, I realize that this isn't sounding like a huge invitation into this kind of walk. <laughs> Um, and I say this in the knowledge that I have not experienced some of the things that some of my panelists have. Um, but I want to say that it's worth it. Oh, absolutely. That it's, that I believe, like everyone else up here, that if you have this calling, if you have this platform, if you have these opportunities, you have a moral obligation to do this kind of work. Um, I think that a lot of people would want to do it. Don't do it because you want to be famous because it's the wrong kind of fame. And don't do it because you want to make money because it's honestly not that lucrative unless you sell a really best-selling book. Um, one of the things that I do is I write a column every week. And that gives me the ability not just to speak about what happened that week in, in the news that related to religion that I want to correct, but to showcase and bring to the public the work of my peers in the academy. And that's an honor for me and a privilege that I could take something that I think is really important that I don't think people are going to read, and now 100,000, a million people are going to read that. Um, and that does valuable work for our peers. And I think the opportunity to do that, um, as, as hostile as the environment is now, when I started seven years ago, the academy felt a little lethargic, frankly. People would say things like, oh, it's self-promoting. Why would people even be on Twitter? But now, now we feel an urgency. Um, so I would say that it's worth it. I would say it's an obligation. And I would say now, at least in the broader academy, there is at least a sense that this is important and this is something that we should do. Um, I, I think I would say, you know, kind of back to the themes that 
I type my notes about. Um, for the question for me has been um, not only how do we break free of the prison that is the ivory tower, but to break the bars themselves. Um, that's what it means to dismantle structures and systems. And academia is a system and a structure that's part and parcel of the larger um, systems that are oppressing others. So when I think about the commitments that illuminate public scholarship, um, public religion scholarship, um, none of us on this stage except David are actually meant to be, according to the rules of the academic prism, prison. He's the only one anointed as a white male to be a public religion scholar. The rest of us are fools. We're fools. It's foolish for us to do what we do. We're not rewarded for doing what we do, not monetarily, not really in terms of um, the incentives of our profession. Um, and so it takes fools like us, whether I ever get tenure again, that's, that's a risk I'm willing to take. That's not the goal for me anymore. And so I think doing public scholarship frees you, but what you have to do prior, friends, is do the soul work to be in a position where you're risking your fucking family to do what we do. Where your parents stay awake all night reading all the shitty comments that people make about raping you, my mother. My father who falls asleep as soon as his head puts the pillow at 9 p.m. and my mom says for the first time in our marriage, your father is pacing the floor at night. When your parents are saying, we'll risk our retirement, we'll sell our house to support you in the fight for your life. That's what public religion scholarship looks like, having to decide whether to give a talk because it might risk the lives of your children. Those are the stakes. These aren't my notes. It's real. And even for David, as a white man, the stakes are real. That's what he told you. His white privilege doesn't insulate him from all the crazies. We do public scholarship as what I call embodied solidarity. We don't do it for rewards. We do it because it's right. We do it because in my tradition, the Christian tradition, Apostle Paul says, and we don't do it for sacrifice, I hate that word, but I'm correcting myself because this hero sacrifice language is not the right language. But the Apostle Paul says we are all called to be living sacrifices. That is a reasonable expectation, the pa Apostle Paul says, of worship for Christians and a reasonable expectation of the privilege that you have as persons in the academy, persons with platforms and privilege, is to be living sacrifices every day in your classrooms, in your scholarship and journals, and in your posture toward the public. So I hope that what we impart to you is thinking about the positionalities and the potentialities and the practices that can transform not just our disciplines, but the world. And those are the things that I think that I hear my friends doing, practicing heterodoxy over orthodoxy, even as a lot of us come from very orthodox, consider ourselves as kind of part of an orthodox tradition and even claiming those orthodoxies, we're heterodox to our orthodox traditions because of what we've done. And considering a prophetic term in academia as part and parcel of who we have to be and performance as part of our scholarship, not ancillary to our scholarship. I think that's what it means to be a public religion scholar. Um, so. Najiba, would you like to get the last word for us this <laughs> afternoon? So I believe the way to a just and free society where everyone is free is through critical thinking. And when you have the incapacity for critical thinking and anti-intellectualism, becomes the way that society makes its decisions, it's inevitable that injustice, immoral decisions will be made. So I do this work deeply, not because of just my religious tradition, I do it because I believe in the beauty of complex, well thought out ideas. And when we live in a time where anti-intellectualism becomes fashionable, 
when we live in a time where people can walk down the streets of Charlottesville saying about the Jews in our country that we will replace you, that we will do these types of things. It's based on a distorted history. It's based on a distorted version and understanding of each other's religious traditions. There is no greater antidote to fear of each other than the true knowledge of one another. But sometimes our incapacity to learn needs to be addressed. We are not ready to hear one another. And so what I want to encourage all of you to do is to think about your spheres of influence, whether it's your house of worship, whether it's with the Uber driver when you come here. It's not the ones that speak up that are the problem. To think about Bonhoeffer, it's the ones that are silent. It's the ones that say nothing. It's the ones that forget to teach about slavery in the seventh grade history book. It's the ones that are trying to extract that history. It's the ones that are quiet. It's the ones that are quiet that are the most complicit in the creation of a society where no one is free. Never have I been prouder to be a part of the American Academy of Religion. Let us thank our panelists for everything they have shared with us today.